like, all right, screw it. We're going early. Ah. Yep, blue switch light, blue charging pad. This actually isn't a charging pad. It is a grip strength trainer. So yeah, this is me covering for how bad I am at using OBS. I was like, I'm in studio mode and this side means this and this side means that, right? And nope, the opposite. So, oops, I went live five minutes early when I was trying to do some pre-launch, but that's fine because waiting five minutes of everything is fine. I've just got to wait for people to roll in. That's real boring. Should you paint your own minis or watch somebody else paint? Yeah. Yeah, though. I know that feeling. I watched a bunch of Miniac videos uh, over the weekend as research. Valuable and important research. So, welcome back, stream. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I want to cover some intermediate topics. I want to talk about a little bit of what goes on once you've passed over the really basic newbie topics and, and honestly they blend together there are a few things that you just sort of learn by feel over time but uh, but there are a few more advanced ish techniques beyond put paint on model, make sure you paint inside the lines, more or less. Although if you want to sound like a smart artist, you would say you would like to cover the volumes of the, the model appropriately with paint. Uh, but yeah, the, the things that you get up to once you've gotten ready and you know that you're pretty good at putting paint on model then you get better at putting paint on model. It all goes from there. So let's just do a little bit of review. Last time we messed with this Gherky a little bit. About an hour into the stream, somebody on YouTube called me out for that and uh, dragged just demolished with the truth. <sighs> so here's here's Gurky. Uh, I believe that on stream we got on we got on the first coat of green on Tazat and Gurky and then maybe a little bit of it looks thin here on the model, so we'll just double up. I'm trying to let the autofocus do its thing here, but I think I think I might go into the camera settings and force it anyways. Because that way, when I move my hands, that has an impact. Why are you putting that over here? There we go. There we go. Two thin coats, which is about all Gurky could afford until a little while ago. So for this one, after that two thin coats on stream, I actually put on, I think, at least one more layer on the general green here. And then, as you can see, I did the scarf. That's just the first layer of it. I'm probably going to build that up with a bit more of a yellowish green so that it contrasts nicely. But I think Gurky's looking good. I also hit that little jerkin flap gherkin flap with some of the same green that I'm using on that scarf and I'll probably follow up with that throughout the painting of this gherky mini. Uh, one principle in miniatures painting that I'm not sure if I emphasized last stream was that most of the colors that you use on a model you want to be able to see it in more than one place from most focused angles on the model. Like, you know, if you've got the back of somebody and they've got a huge cloak and all the colors that you can see are the cloak, maybe their head, I'm, I'm not gonna ding you there. This isn't Cinema Sins. So it's a guideline more than a rule. 
And then here is Zot. I'll try to drag him into focus there. Yeah, there he is. Tilt him so the light hits him. That knocks him out of focus somehow. Cameras are good, everyone. Computers are good. So he's gotten a bit more highlighting on the folds of his robe. And you can see that the green of his robe is a much more somber color than Gerke's cloak here, which is a bit more of a cheerful, brighter green. Then another model that I touched over the weekend was Deirdre. Let's get her into focus here. So Deirdre is going to help me talk about how layering or blending up usually goes. Let me pop this off of my brush here. And I might as well do my very first brush lick of the stream. So. So let's see here. Trying to get her in the right focus and the right light, kind of challenging. So this little Lee spot is kind of one of the highlightest, highlightest highlights of this model, along with this right here. It's very light. And then these spaces right here are very light. As Jeff was saying last time, you know, it's a lot like 2D techniques, except you slap them on a 3D object. You, you figure out which parts of the model are highest, and those get the highlight. So this is probably one solid base coat, nice and thinned on Deirdre. And two or three layers of mid-range paint as you build it up, you build into a smaller and smaller section as you build towards the highlight to that highest point. Uh, and this model also has uh, a couple of washes that I've done on it, on the dress especially, to sort of blend things back down a little bit. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean that as I've brought things up, into a brighter color and a higher key, uh, I might find that I need to uh, use a darker color again in a nice thin wash and slop that on again just to make the transition look more gradual and natural. Uh, and this model has a couple of points where you can see kind of one of the weaknesses of my techniques of glazing and using thinned paints in a devil may care way right here you see this little pool of lighter color where it should be some of the darkest blue and that's because i probably slapped this on at a mid-range and now it looks like this weird little highlight where it shouldn't be darn uh, i'm gonna hit that with something dark unless i forget you can also see that I've done Deirdre's hair. When you do hair, you want to build that up to highlights, and you want to do it kind of where it looks most natural. Where it looks most natural is going to be where the hair bends most. So let's see if I can't get the focus and light cooperating with each other. There we go. So you can see that the top of Deirdre's head has the most highlight and also a pretty good variation in the blues on her head. Like most of the RDI figures, uh, it's blue next to blue or green next to green, so I've got to improvise to try and make sure that that looks distinct. Across a model, it probably, across a table, it probably won't. But I'm doing my best, and soon this Deirdre is going to get skin tone, and it's going to look great. Um, something happened to her ear in printing, and 
and I don't feel like using a needle and green stuff to fix it. So uh, nerds to that and we'll see what's up. Another thing that I tried over the week was Zenithal Highlighting plus Washes. So this is another Zot, which was primed in black and then got the Zenithal Highlight treatment. You can see that the bottom of his hands are darker than the top of his hands. Yeah, I should have gotten a lot harder on the white ink, actually. Because this looks very dark, but you see that you can still get a lot of the same results without any little pockets of white primed model peeking out. Although Zot's not a great model to to highlight that advantage, but uh, he's looking all right. We'll see him again some other time. Here's Gurky with the same Zenithal treatment with black primer all over and then white ink sprayed from above and then painting done on top of that with that same attempt to use the darker green on his cloak and a lighter more yellow green for his scarf i did not get his little gherkin flap there shame So that's how layering up usually goes. If you want to see another example of good layering, here is, ooh, I dropped my brush. Let's see if I can get it back without ruining everything. I did. So this is Gorman the Wolf from War Machine. Let's see if I can't get this to light me better. Eh. Clearly I need a light from the other side too, but I'm only making the lighting situation worse by fiddling with it. My life. always have a really big F off flashlight somewhere nearby. Cool. So here we have Gorman DeWolf from War Machine and his very massive cloak. Honestly, I love doing big draped surfaces because it's just so rewarding to figure out where those highlights and lowlights need to go. And blending those areas up slowly, for me, that's the most fun. That's the best actually tried to do some subtle shading on his hat. Just having a good time. And then the inside of his cloak is a very bright color. I don't think the camera is quite up to showing off how that white actually plays out. But that's more or less what you want blending and layering up to do for you. Hand cam. But as you paint models, you'll figure out what your threshold is, what kind of style you have, what kind of results you think look best for you. I have a lot of idiosyncrasies and foibles in my painting that I know lots of other painters don't really do or truck with, and that's fine. It's time to actually get the palette out. Because I want to talk about things, but also paint. Let's see. Do I want to do more Deirdre? Do I want to do more Zod? One thing that's sort of working against me today is uh, it's been a week and all of these greens have dried on the wet palette. 
Wet palettes are great, but they are not magic. They can keep your paint wet for days and days, but a whole week's kind of asking for a heroic effort from me. It's not really fair. Just went in and hydrated the sponge with this guy, which I remembered that I had instead of just a wheedly little dropper bottle. You know, I do still have some greens that are still moist. So let's see what I got. Wet palettes really are great. I'll tell you what, I used to be, I used to be really hype about this kind of palette, a ceramic well palette. And they're still great. These are the peak of using a paint palette that isn't a wet palette. Like if you try wet palettes over and over and you just can't get into it, this is what you end up doing. Um, but for me, I have a hard time with them because cleaning them is a pain in my butt. You can eventually clean them all the way, but, uh, well, it just, it takes a lot of soaking and hot water and soap, and then I've got to dig in there with my fingernails. It's just not a fun time. It's really a barrier to me continuing to paint. And while it is picky to set this up and get the parchment paper on it just right, I find that a lot easier and a lot less suffering than cleaning a, a ceramic palette and getting that ready. You know, I just lay, I just moisten the parchment, lay the new parchment on, make sure there are no bubbles, make sure the sponge is hydrated, and I go. And this will last me one whole painting project, usually. So it's a pretty simple part of being like, I should paint these guys today this week, etc. It's a lot of fun. So let's see, I think I'm going to keep working on Gurky and Zot. And Deirdre will continue to be sort of an off-season model that I'll paint between streams. Demystic says, I hate cleaning my things. So naturally, I have an airbrush and 3D printers, things with little fiddly bits that need cleaning. Yeah, yeah. I don't enjoy cleaning my airbrush, which I don't do very thoroughly or well, but, you know, I, I run a few drops of the paint thinner through it and scrub it out with a brush. And call it a day, I guess, but... It still sucks. There are some parts of our hobbies that are just never going to be fun. So one topic that I wanted to talk about today was how to handle your brush better. So one thing about handling a paintbrush, and actually kind of all artistic uh, endeavors that require manual skill is that your hand is always going to be more steady when you are pulling it towards you than pushing away from you. There we go, pushed in a little too much. So however you have to hold the model in order to get that pull action instead of pushing. Go ahead and make that happen. Oh, Demystics lost some nozzles down the sink drain. Oh, I hate losing things down the sink drain. Especially because sink drains are so gross. There's always something in there that makes me want to die. So right now at this stage of Gurky's Cloak, one, I'm kind of trying to figure out what I blended this green for in the first place. So I'm kind of putting it where I'm not afraid to put it. It seems like it's 
a decent highlight color for his cloak. Just getting those high surfaces. And if I blend it up a little too much, it's okay as long as I do it with a thin paint. I can come back in and dry out its finer qualities later. I kind of like the way this natural highlight is going. It's another thing that I like about my detail wash. Yep, learn to have your hands touching as often as possible. That was something that I covered, I believe, in my first stream that I'm happy to repeat because it made such a big difference when I was painting. Um, make sure that your hands are touching in at least like three places. One is fine if that's the only way you can reach what you're doing. You'll find yourself like doing this to make sure that you've got a little bit of stability. Um, but if you can get three points between your hands touching, or, you know, your painting hand touching, even the painting handle, you know, let, let something like that transfer the stability from your model hand to your painting hand. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Out here. Hmm. Side has some good highlights going on his back already. You can see that kind of dark stripe of his back already down on this cloak. And I like where that's at. Honestly, his cloak is such a somber color that I'm not sure I want to bring any of his highlights up much further. Now, I should probably still do it because in a miniature, you want to exaggerate the highlighting a bit because of scale. Yeah. Happy little highlights. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Yeah, sometimes when you're putting down highlights, you're just going to get a little drop of paint. And sometimes that's a disaster, and sometimes you're like, yeah, paint, you're going to be a little drop there. Just a very severe little highlight built up all by yourself. Does anybody want to hear about paint chemistry again? Remember, the way that paint behaves has a big impact on how you can paint your model and how the paint behaves is 
reliant on its chemistry. This might be the last time I touch this particular part of Zot's cloak. Like the underside of that folded hood right there. I don't think that a lot of people are going to be looking too hard at that. They're going to be looking at his head. They're going to be looking at this part here. I'm having this little lip of fabric nice and highlighted. I think that's going to make the biggest impact. Well, I think I'm going to skip over repeating myself about paint chemistry and talk about fancy pants techniques. You've seen me use washes multiple times because I just love doing it because I'm lazy. When I talked about bringing down the highlights again, that's kind of covered by glazes. In a glaze, you use a really transparent layer of paint to smooth the transition between different layers. Is it lazy or clever, Sam says? Um, por que no los dos? My, my desperation to not be painting in a really boring way for all time definitely makes me do a lot of different things. I'm definitely thinning my paints and using uh, acrylic medium in my paints to make sure that they are more transparent. It means that, uh, means that I can get over some of my cowardice as well, frankly. It is not as scary to put a, you know, halfway transparent color over the top of something else you just did, as it is to blend colors to what you think should go and then try to hit it exactly on a tiny figure. I think Sam's aside, his interjection, leads to an important thing. If you're using a shortcut and it makes you happy, don't be ashamed of using your shortcut. Your toolbox of techniques will grow along with you as need be. This guy here is a very dramatic fold, so I want it to have a nice highlight. Built up nice and slow. Same with this guy. And Zot's knee here. This little fold. So what other great techniques are there out there in the world? Uh, there's wet blending. Wet blending is definitely a scarier technique. In wet blending, if I'm remembering right, you know, I researched fun newbie topics and I didn't go, mm, do I have my definitions correct? So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But but one technique is to put some paint down on the model and then quick clean off your brush, get a new color of paint, you know, your, your next highlight layer up on there. And while that previous layer is still wet, blending those two together on the model. Uh, you can create some very nice looking transitions that way, but it takes a lot of confidence, a lot of skill, and definitely, definitely a slow pace of paint drying. Ooh, hmm. I hit a little bit of a clump in my paint. 
I think you can kind of see the texture on Zot's knee there, so I'm going to have to go in there and get it. There we go. Phew. You do not want to add details by making crunchy paint go on your model. Next up, uh, a really good beginner technique that can also kind of elevate itself to intermediate levels is dry brushing. Now, I believe I've already said that I don't do much dry brushing. I'm not, I'm not a big believer in it. But in dry brushing, you take a brush that's, you know, really bristly and stiff and probably dead or dying. A brush that can't hold a point and that you definitely wouldn't use to do detail work anymore, but still has a little bit of spring to the bristles. You take that guy and you get some relatively thick paint on it. I wouldn't dry brush with thinned paint. You take that thicker paint on that brush and you clean off as much as you can while still having some wet on the brush. Wet-ish. I'm not even going to call it moist damp on the brush, but you take that dry brush and then you just you just beat it on the model. And because there's so little paint on the brush and that paint itself is so thick and dry, it really only hits the high points of the model. So dry brushing is a technique that a lot of folks use for things like chain mail, um, really highly textured surfaces. Uh, Gog scale mail here is actually a great example of a surface that is ripe for dry brushing techniques because if you went in and you dry brushed, say, silver on this, then that silver paint would hit those scalloped edges and not go into the deeper recesses. So I don't really enjoy doing dry brushing, but Army Painter has some specially made dry brushing brushes, so maybe I'll get some of those and dip my toe back into that field or river or pond, or kiddie pool, or some other metaphor. It's an excuse for me to buy painting products and, you know, I enjoy my hobbies through purchasing. Aspirational purchases. Uh, another technique that I wanted to talk about today was non-metallic metals. Uh, I don't do them. I'm afraid of them. They're scary. In non-metallic metals, let's see here, so that's another bad example. Gog is another good example. So in non-metallic metal, metals for Gog's axe here, what you would do is paint this up with a really bright whitish color, probably a whitish blue, right? and then blend in a grayscale shade and then have maybe a sharp contrasting white and then back to that grayscale shade and maybe a fade it down to a blue. Basically, you use regular Ars paint colors and not entirely surface-based highlighting to create a metallic shine effect. And like I said, I'm terrified of this technique. I don't know how to do it. I've seen tutorials of very smart people doing it. I've seen folks doing really smart tutorials of how to make it seem simple. And I went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Screen, no, I'm not gonna do that. However, if you learn how to do non-metallic metals, I absolutely respect you. NMM is so cool, it's such a, neat looking technique and I think it's another one of those techniques that's very expressive 
I think it says a lot about how you, as a painter, see metal. Which is a very frou-frou arty thing to say, but it's quite literally what you think looks metal in a legitimate fashion. If that makes sense. Which makes it just a real banger of a technique. Me, I'll take just regular metallic paint, I'll thin it a little bit, maybe I'll mix in a color with it to make it look not so glittery. And then I'll still do a couple of layers of that paint on a surface. You know, if I'm doing a sword, then I'll do one kind of bright metal and then an even brighter metal on the edges. The surfaces that I think are catching the light. Just to really push the idea. Alright, well I'm pretty happy with where Zot's highlights are here. I think I need to figure out where I want to go next with him. You know, I'm going to talk about a technique while I do it now, because this little spot right here, we know what that looks like. That's a red gemstone. So I'm going to do a gemstone right now. Let's see here. to my paints. Belch a little bit because I'm gross. And shake up some burnt cadmium red. Eh, this cavalry brown's not really the kind of red I want for an offset. Gory red. Rojo visceral. I love it. That guy's definitely going in. Scar red. I'm going to shake you up just to compare you to burnt cadmium red. Let's see what's going on. Human icky. I don't get what you mean, Sam. Oops. Well, I shouldn't hit the camera. That's probably bad for it. I looked into getting one of those little... They're... They're like pods. They're little round metal things. And you just, you put the bottom end of the paint onto it and it shakes the paint for you. Oh, yes. Yes, I am a disgusting gas-filled human. Um, but yeah, paint shakers, a good one is like a hundred dollars. I'm not quite into that yet. Probably should be though. Painting, shaking my paints is one of the more annoying, tedious things, especially because I use paint that's older than I am. I should probably just drop the hundo and call it a day and just let my life be transformed. It'll be like uh, that Russian parable about the overcoat. And I finally save up the money to get the one thing that would really make every day of my life more comfortable and more easy. And the warmth that it brings just transforms my whole life into a series of happy events until somebody steals my overcoat and then I become a vengeful ghost. Anyway, I think this is shaken enough. But is it clogged? Is it clogged is probably just a whole YouTube channel concept right there. Guys, you can have this idea for free. Is it clogged? You just open things up and see if they're clogged. Doesn't have to be paint even. Let's see, how is that? Is that clogged? No, it's, it's actually kind of not. Freaking amazing. I'm just gonna put it, I think right here next to my greens like a heathen. Oh, it's got a little trail. It's got a little dangly dangly. It's probably bad. 
Okay, it is kind of clogged. Never mind. This stream had brought me a secret weapon. A needle. Probably put down way more paint than I need for this. Don't need the sharp lying around, but that's fine. <laughs> Did you measure how much force it takes to unclog something? Yeah, that's definitely a good sequence. Keeps the science heads entertained. Now let's open up the scar red. See how that looks. Next to the oh, that one is quite liquid. Makes me wonder if I haven't shaken the pigment into it. Hmm. Just watching the, I don't know if this, yeah, it does. So it's still a little splotchy at the bottom. It used to be all this color around here. So I done messed up. And my paint chemistry is forever changed for this pot of paint. Hmm. Some things you just have to accept. Oh my goodness. Look at that. Look at that mess. All right, well, I'm just going to leave it as is on the wet palette and shake gory red a little bit more for good measure. this clogged. Once again, it doesn't seem clogged, but oh, cool. I got a nice serviceable drop out of that. Good times. I don't have to buy new paint for that today. Work. Put a drop of water on my darkest paint. in. So now I have a, a little array of reds to play with for Zot's gemstone. The gory red and the scar red really don't seem very different. So I'm going to take something else here. Probably some blackened brown. Jen, why not a black? Uh, because I'm super mistrustful of blending with black, and and it looks too cartoonish for me. Same thing with a pure white. I don't like blending with pure white. rather blend with a brown that I feel is uh, pro an appropriately neutral color. So I think I'm gonna take this here and for you. And a little goes a long way basically too dark and a little bit too transparent for my tastes. Oh man, that bright red's very thick right now. That's nice. It looks kind of purplish, but you know what? I'm vibing with it. I think that's fine. Get in there and we lay down that 
darkest surface color. Oh. All right, I need to back off for a minute because my brush was peeling some of the red off near the center because that paint was drying just enough for my brush to not be nice to it. And that's going to need a second coat before that dark color really lays in. There we go. I like that. Looks nice and deep. Looks a little deeper in person than it does on camera. That's a little funny. I'm gonna let that dry for a minute so that neither of us get boards. Gets bored. Get boards. Ugh. See here. Let's take gold. Oh, Sam uh, brings up another question. Uh, are you the sort who layers up colors from big areas to small areas or from light areas to dark areas? Um, I I layer up colors from big areas to small areas. So I go and I cover all of Zot's green cloak with the darkest, and I do that in a, a thinned green kind of wash consistency that's a bit transparent so that the highest parts are still kind of light. And then I go over that with a lighter color going covering smaller spaces as I go from lighter to color to lighter color. Um, blending from light areas to dark areas seems... That seems procedurally dangerous to me because if I have previously covered parts of the model with a light color and then I go close to that with a really dark color later like, if my hand spasms, which happens sometimes, where my fingers just go, Wah! I have now put a dark color on top of a light color, and then what do I do? Uh, it's much harder to correct that, but but if other people make it work, then that's A-OK, -A, -OK, a plus great for them. Uh, I would not do it myself. Gold just wants to pour itself out without me trying, so I'm going to get the cap back on before I lose more. That's another thing that I love about uh, wet palettes is that they waste significantly less paint. So I get to be very cheap. Or, to be frank, I get to spend on the spendy paint and make that last forever too, just like the free paint. Speaking of which, now that I have the gold on, I'm going to put a little bit of Formula P3 Mixing Medium. This bottle is thicker than the last bottle of P3 Mixing Medium that I got. I'm not sure what's up. Because it's thicker, I'm just going to put water on that. Oh, speaking of water, one fun special effect that I wanted to talk about today was water effects. Just to veer all over the place, here's a model that I did years and years ago. 
and as you can see, she has a little water feature going through her base. Which, if you're going to do something like this, um, honestly, I would check around um, train people. You know, the folks who make model trains? Those folks are really, really good resources for, I want to have a waterfall, I want to have a little stream, I want to have a little pond. Uh, but basically, what you do is you take something like this and you plan it out on your model and you paint the water blue underneath. I think I've got a, I've got a couple of little koi in there. Uh, and then you cover that with some kind of clear something. Um, I believe I used Mod Podge Dimensional Magic on this. Um, some two-part epoxies might work, although... I would be really careful with those because those have a more intense chemistry and they might they might interact with your paint or the plastic of your base uh, in a way that you don't like. You don't want that to undo your hard work. Pardon me, I've got a little bit of a food-related question coming to me from a different computer resource. There we go. Food assured. Let's see. Sorry about that. Thank you for bearing with me, team. Another fun technique that uh, that sometimes I am brave enough for and other times I am definitely not is there's a little bit of freehand painting on this model because her kimono has little cherry blossom patterns on it underneath there uh, on the skirt it's hard to get the light on it just right but you can see that there and then there's a contrasting white sort of cottony bloom pattern Freehand painting is when you say YOLO as loud as you can and just paint stuff onto the surface of your model without taking into account its texture or its volumes. Uh, I absolutely respect anybody who freehand paints a lot of things on their models. Um, I know that in Wargaming it's... Uh, Using little emblems is common, but also it's a solved for problem because what they do is they use water transfer paper. And what you do is you, you print out what you need on a sheet of this transfer paper, you get the transfer paper wet, and then the toner itself slides off of the paper and you can slide it right onto your model. That is dope as far as I'm concerned. Like, yeah, it's a shortcut. Yeah, you're not freehanding. But you are beating the odds with science, and that is so cool. Uh, so I see people using, like, the same shield emblem for 50 of their guys in a huge troop. That's smart. That's just great. Water slides are the best decals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you want to do freehanding, uh, get good at brush stability first, and remember, pulling is always more stable than pushing. Um, try not to do any side-to-side -side stuff. Hold the model in whatever bizarre way you need to, to make sure that you are pulling the brush down to make the next stroke in your design. But now back to your regularly scheduled gemstone piece. Mm. Having a little muscle cramp there. Uh, just gonna tilt it here and kind of get the palette in view. Saw it in view here. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty focused. I think I'm just gonna go for it. I think I'm just gonna go in with this gory red. That's a little too much on the brush tip. 
if you second guess yourself about how much paint is on your brush, trust your gut. And that seems that seems about right. Just trying to draw it back and cover a smaller area with this lighter red color than I did previously. And honestly, I don't see a huge lot of difference, which is bothersome. I think I may want to blend this up with a different color don't have a particularly strong lighter red. Let's see what red leather ends up looking like once I've shaken it. See, you don't beat the devil out of your modeling paintbrushes. You beat the devil out of your paint. It's gone! Be gone, clumps. Ooh, woof, oh, goodness. This, uh, this paint is very eager to return to the world. This is another thing that you might see in your painting career. A little bit of an old faithful of paint instead of clogs. Oh, hey, can you see the cat hair? Well, I'm sealing it off for posterity. My nieces will one day go through my paints and go, is that a cat hair? Gross. Aunt Jen can't clean. Let's see. So this... This is basically a brown. I think I'm going to leave it alone and on the palette, though, because I think... That's actually a great color for some leathers to do later. So, serendipity. It's not a mistake, it's a good thing. Ah, I can try to blend it up with some yellows. This is Privateer Press's P3 yellow, which I believe I called out specifically on last stream as being a really good high coverage yellow. It's also, saying a neutral yellow is weird because yellow is a super warm color, but it's a yellow that feels neither tilting towards orange or green in a really useful way. So I really like it. It's definitely worth the money I spent on it and the time I spent getting it on over into an actual good bottle. Let's get another layer of red on here and see if the second layer does anything more for me. You know what? Honestly, it does. Good news, everyone. This doesn't suck. But yeah, once you've got things blended all the way up for a gemstone, the piece de resistance, the, the final thing, is that you take a dot of pure white and you go boop to make that little shine effect. And if the gemstone is big enough, you do a bigger white dot at the actual highlight, then you do a smaller white dot on the opposite side of that highlight point. And that makes you look 
real professional. I need to straighten my legs for a minute, everybody, because my stomach muscles are upset at me for using this rig. Oh, nope, my, my muscles are like, no, more relaxed, more lean back. All right, we are changing up my posture for the stream. Posture is another important painting topic. If the posture that you take when you are painting is uncomfortable, take a little time out for your health, for your comfort, and try to figure out something else that you can do to make sure that you aren't hurting yourself by painting for a long period of time. Uh, it's never worth it to give yourself a cramp or a hurt back or anything to put paint on figures. It's tough to train yourself to use something ergonomically correct, but it's worth it. I know some people, they paint just curled up really tightly around whatever they're doing. And some people who are like, they put their elbows on a table and that puts the mini in their face so that they can do all of their stuff, but their back is still straight. And, uh, Clearly, I need to do a little work on that. But while we're waiting for my posture to have some positive effects, we're going to take this gold, blend it up. Oh, look at how, how much it's covering my brush. That's, that's gross and bad. Don't leave it like that for very long. Remember, if you get paint up in the ferrule, that's the metal part of your brush that holds your bristle to the handle, once you get paint that's dried in here, your brush loses a lot of its flexibility and spring. And if it stays in the body of the brush, that's this portion right here-ish, then you lose some paint capacity. And that sucks. I'm going to take some of this gold, slap it over here. I think I'm going to mix it in with some of this yellow to make it shout color without shouting glitter quite as loud. A little dab will do ya. And let's hit some of these gold medallions on Vlad's necklace here. Yes, I will eventually have to go in and do a little gold ring around the gemstone that I've painted. I'm going to do that not on stream, where I can hold the mini in many more bizarre ways to make sure that I'm stable. And that's coat worn done. It's not having a big impact, but... It's something. Oh, Chop and Stance is uh, building a table right now. That's cool. What kind of table are you building, Choppy? Coffee table. Ah, that's also cool. I like coffee tables. Ah. One last technique effect that I wanted to talk about on today's stream was using different kind of varnishes on different surfaces. So when you're done painting a model, you'll typically cover it with a coat of clear matte varnish to protect your paint, you know, from chipping and just general wear and tear and you putting your fingers on it. 
uh, but you can also get varnish that is glossy. And so for this gemstone surface, I'd be very tempted after I'm done painting this model and getting it varnished to go back in and go boop with a little bit of the glossy just to really push that sense that it's a different material than everything else on his model. Uh, similarly, once again here comes the all blue all the time Deirdre. For Deirdre's hair, one thing that I want to do for this figure specifically is when I'm done putting all of her other colors down, I want to matte varnish the whole thing and then I want to gloss varnish the hair. And that way the hair will have this different surface finish to it. And hopefully that should bring significantly more variance between the blue of her hair and the blue of her dress. But <sighs> It's high effort, but Deirdre's worth it. Oh, simply a simple Amazon build coffee table, mostly Allen screws. Yeah, it's still good to have a new coffee table. All right. Yeah, I think I'm gonna leave that gold alone for a bit longer. Yeah. Do I want to give this gemstone a little pink spot before I go to the light? Well, let's see what kind of orange I can get. Right, this red. And that pier 3 yellow. You know, it does look kind of pink. even higher there. I'm liking that. I might do a second coat on that. Take it a little smaller. Time. Maybe now's time to do some browns on this figure. I think what I'm going to do is take my special brown wash that I use for practically everything. By the way, here's the formula. 10 parts water, 10 parts flow improver. 60 parts mixing medium, one part walnut brown, four parts blackened brown. I finally went in with a uh, little label maker. That way I don't have to hope that the Sharpie marker will stay on forever. Oop, I'm just gonna drop that drop of wash right. Oh, well that's two drops, oops. I'm going to drop that right into that red that I didn't really want to use. I'll blend them together. Hmm. It's hard to see from the palette right here, what that's going to look like on the model, but it's socks on fancy rope belt, so I'm not too nervous about being inauthentic here. Watch tonight on YouTube, somebody's going to be like, excuse me, that's not the color of Zot's belt. I 
once you've uh, gotten to a good place with your larger surfaces, you could start dialing down to the smaller surfaces. I find that hitting the larger surfaces first also helps me feel a bit more accomplished as I go from color to color on a model. Is it me trying to head fake myself? Yeah, but you know, whatever keeps me painting. Because this is nice and thin, I can just go in there, cover it as I need to. So it's fire hand is a bit in the way here. I think I'm going to do this Zot's uh, fire with that same green fire from his Battle for Greyport art. Oh, we found another area where the, uh, where the primer is not helping us, and there's a bit of resistance to taking up that paint. That sucks, and I don't like it, but we're gonna make it through. Notice that I even kind of don't care if this paint goes into the sort of recesses next to the belt itself because it's using that detail wash color. Kind of don't care as long as it doesn't get super out of control. It's like I'm going in and doing a lining, but uh, without having to be super accurate with my brushwork. Hmm. I wonder if Zot's shoes are really dark or kind of not. I think they're probably pretty dark. I'm going to start with this color for them. Let's just get that base color down get that camera visible for you, get that good paint on brush action. Hmm. This one's a little hard to get on the brush. Just gonna go around like that. More resistance. Oh. That paint's just aligning back onto itself there. There. Just gonna leave that be for a little bit. Come back and hit it with another coat later. Is there any other part on Zod where I might want to use that belt color? I don't think so. No, I think now's a good time to swap over. Well, probably that gem's dry. I can try to give that one little hit. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, now I'm going to swap over to Gherkin for a minute. I'm going to look at 
this cookie. Let me give myself some ideas. This one's got kind of a warm leather and then a really tan leather working together. I think this can be a decent base for that warm leather. I should try to keep it off of those tan highlights. Although in this version of the model, the, uh, the distinction on his leather vest is not, not as bulky. That's kind of fascinating. in there and try to make sure that I have enough of this on that surface to pull a little bit into the details. Oof. That one's going to be tough. Well, let's compare them side by side here. Oh, his belt has notches in it on the new version. That's cool. Well, I mean, he's got a belt you can see that has notches in it in this version. And not just his, uh, his dagger belt. That's pretty cool. And challenging, but cool. Gonna have his belt be the darker leather, which means it's gonna be mistaken for his pants, but I kinda don't care because I want that contrast between his dagger belt and the rest of the leather that he's got on him. Oh, you can see the dagger belt sort of bending over his leg here. That's cool. It's really gratifying working with a really cool sculpt. Alright, I'm going to leave that where it is for now. And probably give this plenty of time to dry. Let's see how that gem is looking now that the paint's a bit drier. I really like where that's at. Now it's time to grab a wipe. Now I do have a wipe because even though I don't like blending with it, it is super useful for effects highlights. It's a flat aluminum, so I'm uh, cheating. Not using the light. buy some. Came pretty thick out of the bottle there. So I should probably touch it with a little bit of water. 
Not a huge amount. I do want it to be a fairly opaque white. But I don't want it to dry on the brush before I get it in the spot. So all of this focus and attention on that red gem is also a part of another important model painting strategy, which is that you should put most of your effort where people are going to be looking the most, i.e. around the face, around that head area. Um, if the model has any other particularly outstanding features, somebody's got this wicked one-of-a-kind sword. It's kind of not where I wanted that to end up. But it's not so off that I'm going to do it over. There we go, we have a gemstone. Boop! I definitely could have blended that a little harder, but I don't care. I like the way it looks. It's nice. It's deep. It's red and it contrasts that green cloak. But later on, I'm going to probably be sweating this little spot right here. This little focal point dot on Zot's weird skull cap. I'm going to go look at Zot's character design art. Yep, yep, it's red. That's what I thought. I'll be putting another little red dot there. But uh, I'm not going to do that right now because that is too small of a detail for me to work on. And that way lies pain. Gosh, look at his mutton chops. Right there, you can see him. That's just good. It's a very squinty old man, this Zot. I'm going to have a better time doing his eyes on this one than I did in the last one, but uh, I got a feeling I'm going to suffer. All right, let's, let's take a little bit of this right over here. Try to get a bit more out of my brush. Cool. It's more opaque. It's lighter. So I should be able to just slap it on top. And not have too bad a time. Seeing if I can get this all done in one dip. I think 
I managed. Sweet. There we go. That's looking good. Roby. Time to find that dark color that I was using. It's the base color for Sot's shoes. Hit this picky little thing again. So I backed off on this color on this shoe because of that resistance. That's good. Let's see that spot of white there. I'm just gonna zap that out. No one's going to be looking very closely at Sot's nondescript shoes. So I'm not really scared about getting brown on the green right there. I think that's just something I'm going to be able to get away with. Uh, and that's something that you should keep in mind yourself is, uh, you know, if nobody cares about looking at it, you don't have to care about making it look really intricate. good about this sod right now. <laughs> it's mud. It's mud. Doesn't Zot wear sandals, I think, in the battle for Greyport art? That's a... I feel like Zot's too, too much of that guy to wear an open-toed shoe. I think he'd be like, but dirt could then touch my body. But, uh, let me see, let me paw through a little bit of my, my stuff here. Hmm. Oh yeah, wearing socks with the sandals. Oh God. <sighs> if that's true, then I officially can't stand Sot. So I'm looking at the cover art for Battle for Greyport right now, and them's, them's his shoes. With soles and a, a top sole and everything. You've heard it here first, everybody. Zot's not wearing sandals. Adonis wears sandals. He can represent sandals for us. I wear sandals because my feet get too hot. But I never wear sandals with socks because, once again, my feet get too hot. It just, what's the point? All right, let's see here. I don't want to use that brown that I'm using for socks. Belt mid tone. keep building through these leathers. For just a moment I was like, oh god, there's too much paint on the brush, but I think... I think it's working out. I'm gonna go off camera with the model here real quick because getting that vest underneath his armpit and cloak is uh, a trick. And one of the things that you might want a small thin brush for notice that I've been doing everything I've been doing today with my uh, Windsor and Newton Kleminsky Sable number one brush right here. But sometimes when I need to go and paint a model under its arm, so to speak, you aren't really what I was reaching for, but you are a good example of what I was reaching for. So here you go. I use a thinner, but not much shorter 
brush. So this guy here is going to be able to sneak into spots that this guy is going to bump into some part of the model. I'm going to keep you around just in case. Been over a year since Choppy closely examined Zot's footwear. That's probably an appropriate length of time between observations. Let's see if I can't make this painting cam and not paint handle cam. If you were watching very closely, you might have seen my paintbrush bump into Gertie's cloak and actually bend a little bit, changing where it was going to actually point. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about using a really thin but long brush to sneak into those details. Oh, I could be running out of this color of paint specifically. I'm not really worried about not going over some of the darker points yet because this is still thin enough and the darks are still dark enough that I don't have to worry about not seeing the undertones just yet. Yep, okay, that's visible. And this looked a little too bright for a second, but then I was like, why not that, let that be a highlight? Just let it go, Jen. So there's that. Looking pretty good, in my opinion. He's also got these little bandages up on his forearms, which I'm going to have to figure out. Once again, I'm so happy that I've actually got guideposts for these models. So that makes this a lot of fire and forget of, well, I should do like this, and this is close enough. But I don't need to take the Gertie off the paint handle. What am I doing? Alright. Let's see, Zot's belt's looking pretty good. But I'm getting tired of looking at it. I should touch a different model. Maybe I should just plow through. I think we're going to plow through. Time to make a new color and make a bit more of it because it's going to be important to Gurky in just a second. How much do I want to put in this? Not terribly much. I think I'm going to put down a dot of medium somewhere else on the palette and then bring what I need over with my brush. 
mix that in. Okay, I'm gonna get some water, just off my brush. That looks nice, that looks creamy. Try to make sure that it's not just all soaked up into my brush before I rinse my brush off. And let's get highlighting. But let's lean back so that my stomach doesn't scream at me. This time I'm gonna try a little bit to be delicate. I'm gonna fail a little bit. I'm gonna definitely clump some paint over some braids and that's fine. I can always use a brown wash again to make that line obvious once more. All right, I think my paint dried on the brush tip. dots on that bit. A second there my brush was exhibiting a very fun symptom. Let's see if it's still there. Hmm. Nope. So sometimes on your paintbrush at the very very end there will be a tiny little sub droplet of dried paint dangling at the end of your longest bristle. And that is frustrating, but also funny. I think I'm gonna focus more on the braid that you can see from this angle, for this braid right here, than the stuff that you can see from behind Zod. feel like that's what people care about. And I know that if I hit just enough of these little braid bumps with a nice highlight, not every one necessarily, just enough people will notice it and go, oh, I can see the braid bumps. That's pretty cool. This one really hard to reach braid bump right here. Boom. Boom. Ah. Beautiful. Sad. You know what, if I stopped here without getting these braid bumps and bringing them to a nice highlighted color, this would still be a pretty great model. It can be really easy to get into a mindset of, oh well, so and so up on example website did this particular amount of detail work on a similar or the exact same model as me. 
therefore my painting is bad and I should give up and stop doing it. But honestly, it, it, come on, it's not, it's not really a competition unless you've literally entered a contest. So you should paint where the intersection of your pleasure with the model and your skill in painting happens to be. Just as close to that as you can get. And not really worry too hard about going further. Because if you don't like the hobby, then you're not going to paint very often. And if you do like the hobby, you're going to paint new things. And your skills are going to improve. And it's going to be super cool. And in fact, I grabbed a special thing for you guys today from my collection of backstock. Here is the first mini that I did with expert advice using painting mediums and glazing techniques and blending and so on. Here is what that looks like today. Let me try to adjust her to the correct light. Here she is, looking like a model, honestly. Where the green of her cloak kind of blends in somehow with the brown leather of her bag. And I could have lined that space there. I'm still pretty happy with this base, though. Let me get that in the light correctly sculpted that all out with green stuff. Kind of crumbed in some flock so it looks like it's got mossy growth inside of it. But here she is in some relatively plain looking colors that kind of don't pop off of her skin. You know, that could be blended a bit better. There we go. Her eyes look... Uh, surprised and also this one looks like it goes into her eyebrow but you can still see some good stuff I still like the way this sort of bluish black leather blends up and has that brass popping off of it you know I still like I still kind of like the color scheme I just think I could have done it better this little brass band here, it's very delicately painted and I didn't get any on the flesh, but a little bit of lining would probably have gone a long way. Same with her hand here. But you know what? I'm still proud of this model. I learned a lot painting this figure. And I'm never going to strip this model and start over. Because... It represents my history of growing as a painter. And I hope that if you guys try painting, or if you start trying new things in your painting, that that's how you feel about the minis that you might still have some problems with. Heck, even my favorite mini that I've ever painted, I'm still like, eh, I could have done this or that, or, or improved this or that, but... Uh, it still taught me a lot, it was still a lot of fun, and I'm still super happy with it. So, anything that isn't just bare plastic, bare metal, or just my step one of getting it primed and detail washed, you should feel good about that. Let's see. want to hit more Zod belt time. I think I don't. I think I want to try more Gurky Pant. Got about 20 minutes left of stream. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Has anybody broken open their uh, pile of shame and tried to pull something out? Get it ready.
Oh yeah, I don't like the way that's going. Sorry guys, it's gonna dip out of view for a sec, but needs must. There we go. Oh, that underside of the leg there will just hit it, and I'm not gonna be as careful. Because Gerky's cloak is in the way. So the mere fact that there's some paint there is frankly going to be enough for most people. Pizza break! Chop and Stan says that uh, they're taking a quick pizza break. The important step of all painting and construction. It's true, honestly, uh, sometimes, sometimes you gotta take a break. If you can't make a decision, if you're getting a little frustrated, if you're getting a little crick in your neck, then just take a break, it's fine. Remember, you're doing this for fun in your spare time, so don't kill yourself over it. And have some pizza. Now I'm going to get a little precious about where it goes. Just a little bit right up there. <laughs> Screw it. I'm done with that. God, getting in between the belt buckle. Ugh, kill me. As you go from larger surface to smaller surface, you're gonna spot the parts that are going to annoy you. And it can be helpful to plan ahead. Oh, yeah. yeah, don't. Sorry to give you some more paint handle cam there, but uh, here's how that blend up is kind of looking. I'm enjoying the way that the warmer gray is blending up out of that cooler, warmer gray, what am I saying? Warmer brown. Blending up out of that cooler, darker brown. And I just splat it a little bit. Just gonna go in with a wet brush and correct that a little bit. Pleasing. I will probably blend that up a little bit further before I call it done, but I like where it's at. I like what it's doing. You might notice that this little bit of string or something is still kind of not painted. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that. I'll probably paint it the same color as Gerky's boots end up being. And his boots are probably going to match his dagger belt and this tiny little line. Let me see if I can get it. Yeah, there it is. This tiny little line of unpainted part right now on his vest. 
So those are going to match. I'm also going to have that be the outline of this little jerkin guy here and have that match so that his outfit looks like it, you know, is one outfit. And it all belongs together forever. So that's pleasing. What else should I do in these last minutes? I should probably hit Zot's belt with a dark wash. Uh, to bring that lining and undertone. Oh! I almost used Contrast Gullum and Flesh to do that. Don't do that! Here we go. Another reason why I kind of don't want to get those paint shakers is because they probably make a lot of noise. That seems annoying. Those grapes were probably sour anyway. going to be hard to tell that I even did that for some time. A lot of times when you put some paint on your model, you don't really know what it's going to look like until it's dry. There we go. I just want to look at Deirdre for a second, thinking about how do I try to do her metal details? I really need to do her skin first. And I'm not really feeling painting skin today. Not sure why. case, I think it's time to get that tan leather. I'm going to be using medium flesh to get that started. Gross, but leather is flesh. And I'm not going to use it on its own. I'm going to use it with that red brown, I think. Gushies. Oof. Oh, gross. This paint's a little lumpy. Let's see if I can show you. It's 
this one. Oh, oh, yellow made a run for it. Well, <sighs> let's see here. Could take a little bit of this medium from over here. Slip that in. Try not to go past the edge of my parchment paper. If you've ever watched a Miniac video and you've seen his paint palette, it's just, it's a horror show. It's, there's so many paint stains on it. Just not a bad thing. It's just not how I would run things. Hmm. Now as I'm looking at this color on the palette, it doesn't look light enough for me. What should I add to it? Let's see, I've got this linen white and I've got this bone white. Here, let me actually put them in front of the camera. I think bone white's probably the right way to go. Oh, we got another leaker. There we go. Put a little bit of you, just a little bit of warmth and darkness. A little bit of you. In fact, we're just going to blend these two edges together. Yeah. Back up the rest of that mixing medium. It's just looking very skin colored all the way down. Gods are trying to tell me something. Ooh, that needs way more washing. In the meantime, here's all the skin tones I accidentally made. Oops. Well, skin tone is not really a five minute topic. Unfortunately. So, hoo -hoo. You know, the last time I did this, I'm gonna just be honest here. And take that previous Gurky and put him into focus. The skin on his arm and the highlight leather. They look pretty similar. <sighs> well, I'll have to figure that out later. Maybe I can give it a more stark highlight than I would the other stuff. Yeah, let's see if I can get those strings without killing myself. Sounds like my roommate's listening, watching cat videos or something. Amusingly sad thing happens to cat. Five minute mega mix. Hmm. 
got him, I think, but... Uh... I don't know, folks. Most wasted effect or second most wasted effect? As long as your paint is wet enough, you can also sort of dial in your stroke. Which, uh, phrasing, but also you start at a point where you're pretty sure your brush isn't going to hit the model. And then you go in closer, very slowly, while you watch very carefully where the paint is actually landing. And that way, you can do those details without slopping paint onto something else you've already done. Leading to tears and shouts of, no, what are you doing? To yourself, mostly. Sorry, folks, trying to find the right angle. I think I'm going to get this first coat down. And then I'm going to call it quits for the day. Now it sounds a little bit more like there's some losing in a video game going on. Oh, just one little piece left. Dagger belt, I'm coming for you. You know what? It's a practice what I preach moment. It's time to use the thin liner. Save me, Skinny Wan Kenobi. My only hope. Into the invisible depths of underneath an elbow and a cloak. Yeah, I basically hit it. Sweet. And I'm not gonna bother with what's totally behind the cloak, because I'll never see it. You'll never see it. Unless he gets popped off his base or something. Which, uh... Fair procedural point. Some people will actually put a pin in somebody's foot, in their model's foot, and then paint it completely without basing it. They'll have a, a different paint handle. They'll usually just use a chunk of wood and then drill a hole for a very long pin to just go doink right into. That way you can get underneath and get everything. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. Here we go. Here's, here's Gerke's lily white butt. I might go in with a dark green, maybe, or a dark brown, probably, and just go and uh, ruin Gerke's dignity. But also, that is probably exactly as much effort as I'm required. Oh, no, you can kind of see it through here. Nope. Next time on Paint Stream, Jen made terrible mistakes. But that's for a different stream. For now, thank you so much for spending time with me. It was really fun painting for y'all, blathering about painting techniques like I do. And I will see you next week, once again on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, not Eastern, sorry, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'm from Michigan, so I have a hard time with these Pacific times. It is a struggle 
I'm going to clean my brushes like the sweet little princesses they are. And hopefully get a little bit more painting ahead done on some other models and have some exciting stuff to show you. And together, more models will be painted. It's a good time. Oh, thank you again. Chop and Stan says, see you next week. That's right. And happy streaming. <laughs>